Uh, welcome. It's the Colorado State University uh, Coping with the Colic course. Um, we do have an outstanding program lined up for you tonight. Um, we do have three veterinarians, three panelists who are going to uh, talk about colic in the field. Um, and then uh, coming up, our second session will be October 22nd with uh, Dr. Eileen Hackett and Dr. Diana Hassel talking about what happens uh, to the colic course once it comes into the hospital. So just to begin, my name is Luke Bass. I'm uh, one of the field service veterinarians here at CSU, uh, part of the equine ambulatory team. Um, and I do have two outstanding um, co-hosts, if you will, Dr. Elsbeth Swain and Dr. Alicia Yoakum. Um, they're, they're new to our team, and I'm very excited and very happy to have both of them here. Uh, Dr. Swain, would you like to just uh, spend a couple of minutes introducing yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Swain. I actually graduated from CSU four years ago and then went to Wisconsin for an internship and then UC Davis for an internal medicine residency. I'm very happy to be back in Colorado. Cool. Thanks, Elsbeth. And, and Dr. Yoakum, can you just give us a couple of, uh, a couple of tidbits to know about you? Sure. Um, I'm Dr. Yoakum. Uh, I graduated from UC Davis in California. And I did an internship at a private practice in Virginia, and now I'm here, uh, really happy to be part of this team and really enjoying getting to know clients in the area here in the Front Range. Cool, thank you. So here's how it's going to go, uh, team. Uh, we're going to have three short presentations on uh, different facets of colic, um, and then we're going to open it up to question and answers. Um, we do thank you for those people who have submitted questions so far, um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, just to begin, the, uh, the kind of background for, for this topic was, you know, colic is, is abdominal pain, and it, it does continue to be one of our biggest problems in our equine friends and our equine patients. And so we wanted to dive in both from the field perspective and from the hospital uh, perspective and hopefully give you some basic practical knowledge that you can take home um, and hopefully prevent, um, you know, prevent you from having to see us in the middle of the night with your, with your horse. So um, let's get started. Dr. Swain is going to go over some anatomy and common causes uh, to get us started. Uh, Dr. Swain, take it away. Okay, let's get started. Okay. So we're going to get started here tonight going through the anatomy and the causes of colic. To start with, colic means abdominal discomfort. And so it can have causes such as gastrointestinal problems or even can come from non-gastrointestinal -gastro organs. So an example of this is peritonitis, which is abdominal inflammation, also liver disease, or even kidney stones or urinary stones can cause this. This picture is an example of kidney stones. The GI tract starts with the oral cavity. Incisors grasp and tear grass or hay, and then the premolars and molars are responsible for the grinding surface to break the hay or grass into smaller surface area, and then they swallow it. And so if there is problems with their dentition or their teeth, then sometimes this doesn't get broken up well, and then they can either choke or predispose them to impactions. The stomach comes next. This is an example of the inside of a horse's stomach. This is a mixture of hay and saliva here at the bottom. And then this region, this tan region, is the non-glandular portion. So this is where the esophagus comes in on the upper part of the stomach. The pink region is the glandular region. This is where acid is produced and the mucus that protects the stomach. But horses are prone to ulceration of their stomach, and this can occur in both the glandular or non-glandular zones. And this uh, is an example of right at that demarcation between the two zones, uh, many ulcers have formed here. The small intestine comes next. And it is very long in a horse. It is about 50 to 70 feet long. This picture shows some intestine here, and they're normally very active. The small intestine is responsible for digestion and nutrient absorption. The cecum comes next, and it lives on the right side of the horse. The cecum is the first of the equine hind gut, 
and it is responsible for feed stuff or hay fermentation and the microbes break up the hay and digest it into nutrients. A large colon does something similar. There's four components to the large colon. There's a left and right component as well as a top and bottom listed here as dorsal or ventral. There's more fermentation that goes on here and, uh, and it's just a big fan fermentation vat essentially for plant fiber and it takes up the majority of the space in the horse's abdomen. The colon is also responsible for water absorption. A lot of water gets absorbed in the colon. The small colon comes next and it is full of little saccules that form fecal balls that we see defecated. The GI causes of colic are, are many, many. So we begin with altered motility. Intestine should have regular propulsive contractions. When this is altered, either increased or decreased, there are many causes for this. Some of, being, of these being inflammation, is either in the abdomen itself or in the intestine, obstruction, so sometimes impactions can alter the motility and stop flow, or the even nervous system, so nerve input to the GI tract can change the motility. Increased motility we normally see as causing diarrhea for our cases, and then sometimes even can lead to displacement of the GI tract. Decreased motility often leads to stomach and, or uh, gastrointestinal impactions. And then this picture shows an example of stomach reflux, which is when the stomach slows down and often the small intestine slows down and then the fluid backs up into the stomach and has to be evacuated via the tube because horses can't vomit on their own. Impactions occur um, for many causes, and it, and it essentially creates an obstruction of the, of the normal flow through the intestine. This can occur from feed material, sand, or even parasites, especially in younger horses. The locations that impactions can occur uh, include all these organs here, and each one presents just a little differently and is treated a little differently. Displacements happen when the movement of the, the GI shifts into abnormal positions, like the picture showing here with the large colon. The colon does this more frequently than the other GI organs. This puts abnormal tension on the blood supply and, and also places pressure on other abdominal organs and causes discomfort. A strangulation can occur when there's compromise to the blood supply of the intestine. And so this can happen when the intestine twists on itself or even if there was a fatty tumor that has a, a little stock, stock on it that can swing around and lasso the uh, intestine and then cut off the blood supply. In summary, the horse has many components to their GI tract, and each one of them comes with its own set of things that can predispose them to colic. There are also non-gastrointestinal causes included here. Thank you so much. Dr. Bass, I'm going to turn it back over to you.
Great. So just to go back, uh, we're going to be talking about the signs of colic. Um, and so uh, this is the next part about, you know, just waiting for your veterinarian and the veterinarian exam. So signs of colic, um, anxious or depressed, just depending on the situation. Uh, the, uh, the horse may, be not, um, may not be passing any manure in its stall or paddock. Um, there could be pain, um, signs of pain in the horse are pawing, rolling, uh, maybe not eating, um, and it could be lying down. Um, unfortunately, horses do commonly try to traumatize themselves or traumatize the environment, so safety is of most importance. Other signs of colic, decreased appetite, lethargy, maybe lying down um, you know, longer than normal. Uh, they could be off by themselves, not coming in from the pasture. Um, they can't have a fever if, if the certain conditions are just right. So what can you do when you're waiting for the veterinarian? Uh, it's basically the most important thing is your safety and the horse's safety. So that may mean putting them in a stall, you know, putting them in a round pen, or it could mean walking them, one of the two. Um, if it's possible, getting the temperature, maybe taking a heart rate if you have a stethoscope, and just watching the pattern of the lungs to see if there's an increased respiratory rate. These things can help us um, you know, determine maybe the cause of the pain once we get there. Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes clients will hear the GI sounds. Uh, looking at the mucous membranes are very important to see what kind of uh, what kind of color the horse has. And then you know, just knowing the presence of manure in the past 24 hours is great. We understand a lot of horses are out in pasture, and that's you know sometimes difficult. But if that can be ascertained, that really helps us out. Um, we ask that you do feed them uh, no food. Um, you know, water is okay. Uh, say, for example, your veterinarian says it's going to be a couple of hours before I can get to you. Um, you know, giving them access to nice, uh, clean water is great, but we ask that there's no food. And, uh, you know, just, just want to apologize for the alarming uh, photo, but it is a, a case that a horse was given Banamine IM. And Banamine is a very common non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that is given to horses with colic with pain, but we just ask that you please do not give those horses um, that banamine in the muscle. It either can go in the vein or it can actually go orally if that's not, um, if that's not feasible, but uh, please do not give it in the muscle. Walking is fine. We actually encourage the horse to be moved about, especially if it's a gas colic, um, but staying safe is the most important thing. If your horse is trying to go down over and over and over, just trying to say, just trying to say safe is the most important thing. Um, a common question, does rolling cause a twist? Um, in my experience, it's actually the twist that causes them to be quite painful. So you can have a twist in the, the large colon, maybe a twist in the small intestine that can cause them to be very painful, and then they roll. So basic exam, it's really nice to know what normal temperature is. You're looking somewhere between uh, 99 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, 101.5. A heart rate, normal heart rate's about 40. A lot of our patients with colic can have heart rates uh, from 60 up to 100. Respiration rate should be less than 20. Um, uh, you know, a lot of our um, our colic cases are you know have a respiratory rate of 30. You know, maybe up to 60. GI sounds should be present in all four quadrants of the GI system. Mucous membrane should be nice and pink with a two-second capillary refill time. And of course, attitude and appetite is a big player in this this issue. Just a couple of pictures to show you um, the complexity of the GI system. Dr. Swain did an outstanding job of describing the different parts, but I just wanted to remind you that it's not one tube in and out. It does have about 120 feet from one end to the other. So it can be quite complex and quite difficult to actually understand a lot of times what's going on, but we have some tools that may help us out along the way. Um, once we get to your horse and once we kind of figure out what, what's going on, uh, we like to, you know, to to try to figure out from, from both ends if we can we can get more information. Um, it's all about getting data. It's all about trying to, um, you know, try to get as much information so we can give you the very best answer. We use we use uh, a couple of different tools. One is a nasogastric intubation. Um, I do have a picture of that in just a second, but that involves placing a tube up the nose and into the stomach of the horse. And the problem with the horse is they can't vomit. And so one of the things we do is try to alleviate any gas or any excess fluid from the stomach via nasogastric tube. We then accomplish um, the same from the other end, doing a rectal examination and realizing if you go back one step, we, we really can't rectal the entire GI system, but we can rectal a, a decent portion of it to really give you, um, you know, the best answer we can. 
Um, you know, we do have the, the capability of doing an abdominal ultrasound. We have a portable ultrasound that can allow us to see part of the large colon, part of the small intestine. Uh, this is a picture here of the large colon. Uh, you can see the dorsal and ventral colon. Um, and on the right side is the cecum. Um, and the reason this picture is up here is we can do a belly tap. And what that means is we take a sample of fluid just from this spot right in here. And that can give us a really good indication of the overall health of the intestines. We don't go into the intestines themselves. We just take the fluid sample from, um, you know, from the fluid around the intestines. And then routine blood work can really give us an indication of the overall health of the animal, whether it be an infectious nature, whether the colic um, could be coming from GI or non-GI signs um, or you know, a non-GI etiology. So things to tell the veterinarian, has there been recent changes in feed, transport, routine? These are common causes um, for colic in the horse. Is, is, the, is the horse pregnant? Has there been any recent vaccinations, deworming? Has the, colic, has the horse colic again? Very, very useful information for us to know. If you've done a quick exam, it's really, really helpful for you to give us some insight on what you've seen. Um, what is the consistency? What is the quantity of the manure in the last 24 hours? And we do ask that if you can, can help from it is try to refrain from any home remedies just until the veterinarian has done the exam. It really gives us a good indication of where your horse is at. And then most veterinarians are open to, open to some things, but it, it's, nice to, it's nice to see the horse you know, before it's treated. So just some, um, some, um, you know, some possible etiologies that we go for. We're talking medical, uh, gas colic, whether it be new grass, um, a high grain diet, or, or if a horse is limited on exercise. Um, large colon impactions are quite, quite frequent where there's weather changes. Um, you can have a, a horse that's dehydrated that's maybe gone off water. Stomach um, or colon ulcers uh, due to stress or medications like antibiotics or anti-inflammatories. Uh, grain overload, this is very common in the ponies, uh, those horses that get into, um, you know, get into grain and, and just really ingest too much. Our foals with meconium infections. And then those cases that uh, will be discussed next week are surgical cases, and those are the ones that horses are very painful. Um, those are, are more of a strangulating lesion, um, intraoliths, um, and a non-GI tract disease. A couple illustrations of the, the small intestine. There's about 60 feet of this, and uh, it's very impressive to see. This is the large colon. This is obviously on the table in colic surgery. Um, and you can see how extensive the GI system is and just how long things are. And that's really one of the, the hard parts that we have in, in, uh, in trying to treat colic is there is a lot of different causes. And so our job is to try to figure out exactly what's going on and do the best for your horse. So the majority of these cases are medical. Um, you know, we see we see a lot of colics, but somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of these uh, cases maybe even be treated in the field. Um, it says here, what will the vet do on the arrival? Obviously, a, a great physical exam. Uh, we talked about nasogastric tube. This is an illustration of a tube going up to the horse's nose um, and, 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 and down the esophagus and into the stomach. We may give the horse banamine or bute. Um, if the pain cannot be controlled with those medications, we will. Uh, usually sedate the horse, um, and then we may discuss IV fluids for rehydrating the horse. It's not as easy as, as just hanging a one liter bag and, and you know, giving a bolus. These horses sometimes can need 20 to 40 to 60 liters of fluids. And then your job will be to monitor from there. And really if there's no response, our first option is to refer it to a hospital. And our job as, as horse owners and veterinarians is really to do the best thing for the horse. And so if, if, um, if the horse is not improving, our, um, you know, our patients aren't improving with what we can do in the field, then we refer them to the hospital for more intensive management. Just a couple, um, you know, one slide on, on what you can do, what you can have. Uh, there's a couple of things here that I would recommend trying to get uh, for colic. One is a thermometer. Another is maybe a stethoscope. Um, and definitely having a light is handy. Uh, for some reason, horses don't like to colic during the middle of the day. They do this most commonly from 6 p.m. until midnight. So just having some good materials with you is, is quite helpful. Just a picture there of a first aid kit to really have on hand. Um, again, this video is going to be on YouTube, so you can reference back to this material um, for bandage and for eyes and for different materials. Um, this is just a good, a good first aid kit to have for these, these unfortunate emergencies.
and from now I'll turn it over to Dr. Yoakum. Um, she's going to talk about how to prevent colic um, and, and, and the best ways um, to, to not have to see us in the middle of the night. Thanks, Dr. Bass. Um, let me just get this. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, oops, uh, colic prevention. So um, kind of what I'm going to talk about is um, diet and water, um, parasite control or deworming, um, some some dental management, environmental management, things you can do during stressful times for your horse, how to make changes in your horse's routine slowly, and um, just to remind us all that we really need to know our horses and what meds they're on, and then talk about some different programs that are out there that will um, help us get through these hard times with colicking horses. So the basics, food and water. Um, if we talk about diet, most of our horses are eating hay. So an adult horse should consume a minimum of one and a half to two percent of their body weight in hay per day. For an example, um, a thousand pound horse, this is about 15 to 20 pounds of hay per day. It's really ideal to weigh your hay um, if you're feeding it to your horses. I know that's not always something that's easy to do. Um, they estimate that a flake of hay weighs about 10 pounds. However, we all know from um, getting different bales the pay that that's not always they're not always the same so if you can get a little scale that's great um, a mineral block is a good thing to have for your horse help provide some some different minerals especially vitamin E and selenium and then um, sometimes the salt will help them drink as well risks associated with certain kinds of hay so alfalfa versus grass hay alfalfa that's grown in California is more likely to cause enterolith formation which are basically large rocks in the horse's um, intestines, which can cause them colic if they get big enough and sometimes need surgery for removal. And then grass hay, um, Bermuda grass hay, so horses that live in the southeast United States or maybe have just come from there, are more likely to have ileal impactions as a type of colic. So those are just a couple things to keep in mind. Maybe think about where you're getting your hay or maybe where your horse has just come from if, they're, if they are colicking. And then um, hay, hay nets and hay bags are a great way to go as well. So horses are designed to graze 24-7, right? If you think about wild horses, they're always out there kind of eating and moving. And we tend to keep a lot of our horses in stalls and paddocks. So any way we can kind of help their GI system work how it's supposed to is great. And hay nets and hay bags can kind of help us do that. So in older horses, sometimes we wind up not being able to feed as much hay, and so there are some complete feeds available for horses. These would include your um, equine senior, so Purina, Neutrina, or LMF are just a few brands. These would be good for horses that maybe have more severe dental issues, really worn older teeth, they can't um, chew or digest their hay as well, or horses that are predisposed to choking, which may also have some of those similar dental issues. And then how much should you be feeding? So most of the bags will tell you, based on the size of your horse, how much of the complete feed they should be consuming per day. And then I just put this little um, picture up here because I thought it was helpful. I know a lot of times I'm not sure you know, what scoop I'm using, how much that'll actually hold. So here down at the bottom you can see um, kind of how they go. This, this plastic one on the left would be about three pounds of equine senior and then the one to the right of that would be 3.7 pounds roughly and then it, they kind of go up so five and a half pounds for the four quart metal container and then seven pounds for the six quart and then one of these little they're sort of the little or buckets you might have out there at the barn would be about 10 pounds and then water so water is really important right so the average adult horse should consume three to seven liters of water per 100 kilograms of body weight so for our same 1,000-pound horse, this would be, it's a pretty big range, but 13 to 31 liters per day, or 3 to 8 gallons. And this is kind of your horse that isn't really doing much. Um, for a reference, these buckets down here in the corner are about um, 16 liters a bucket. And then, um, so that would be at least two of those probably minimum per day for your horse if they're not in any work. And then the more the horse exercises, the more water they should consume. I just thought it was interesting for an intense workload horse, like maybe your racehorse or high-end performance horse could consume up to 90 liters of water per day. 
and a lactating mare should actually consume up to 75 liters of water per day. So just, you know, if that's something you can keep an eye on for your horse, that would be a great thing to monitor. And then why are we talking so much about the water? So horses that don't drink are more predisposed to colicking, especially impactions. So we all know that when the weather changes, we get nervous about our horses colicking. And on really hot days, our horses aren't likely to drink as much water. And we tend to see more impactions then. And as much as we can treat impactions, you know, on the farm, a num you know, a number of times, um, the impactions themselves can lead to more serious forms of colic. And then how can you help your horse drink more water? So we have to remember in the winter that we need to make sure the water isn't frozen and that it's warm enough that our horses actually want to drink it. So trough de-icers or heated water buckets are a great way to go. Electrolytes can also be helpful. Um, there's both powder and paste forms. And then I just put a couple here. This Summer Games Electrolytes um, comes in a paste and a powder form. And then the Smart Lights is a little um, pellet you just put on it as a top dress from Smart Pack. Those are a couple good options. There's certainly others out there as well. And then um, one I like to mention is the sweet tea. So if you know you notice your horse isn't drinking as much water, um, sometimes if you just put a handful of grain in a bucket of water, they want to eat the grain bad enough to drink that water or they like the taste of the sweet water. Just can't leave um, the grain in the bucket of water for more than probably 12 hours or it'll start fermenting. And then um, I think most of us like to make our horses a little mash every once in a while, so that's another good way to add water to your horse's feed to not forget about. Deworming. So I'm not going to touch so much on what to deworm and when, just more how can we kind of formulate a better plan for our horses. So why do we care? Well, um, high parasite burden can predispose horses to colic. In adult horses, it certainly can make them sort of poor, poor doers and predispose them to having diarrhea, which can make them have abdominal pain and thus colic. And foals, if they're not dewormed properly, can develop impactions that can make them colic. So how are we going to develop this plan? Well, you can work with your veterinarian and um, do fecal egg count reduction tests. And that way you can kind of determine which horses in your herd or on your property are high shedders versus low shedders. And then that kind of help tailor your deworming program. So um, we're trying to get away from um, having a lot of resistance that we're developing in these dewormers. And then um, also having this fecal egg count reduction can help you and your veterinarian decide when to deworm and with what. And then a little bit about environmental management. So horses are built to graze like I talked about earlier. Um, I know that, you know, property is not as easy to come by and an ideal stocking rate of one horse per acre of land is not always um, something that we can do for them. But um, the less horses on the, the piece of land, the less, um, the less eggs will develop from worms like we talked about on the last slide. Um, the better the, the grass and the pasture will maintain for them. So you can rotate the horses if you have enough land and um, base this on your fecal egg count reduction test with your veterinarian. And then remove the manure from your paddock at least weekly. And composting the manure is another great thing to think about just to try and reduce um, the amount of manures just kind of sitting on the property that will attract flies and, and kind of create some other problems. And then um, in this lower picture, this um, above ground feeder can be really great, especially if your horses live in kind of a sandy paddock because um, sand developing, if they eat a lot of sand and it builds up in their colon, that can also predispose them to colic. And then um, a lot of our horses live in stalls, um, so helping prevent stress or boredom and uh, cribbing behaviors is another thing we can try. So toys in the stall, like this one here on the bottom left, the nibble net or hay nets can help them make their hay last longer throughout the day. And then things like here on the right, this is kind of a, it's called a Jimmy's um, hanging ball and it's just kind of a treat they can kind of nibble on in the stall and give them something to do during the day. And then teeth, so kind of why do we care about dentals? Well, our horses really should have their mouths at least looked at once a year and a dental float once a year is ideal. Dental issues can predispose our horses to colicking or choking if they can't grab or chew their food properly. And if your horse isn't chewing his hay properly, he might be 
prone to developing impactions either in their stomach or in their um, large colon because they're not breaking down those fibers and so the fibers are staying kind of longer and thicker than they should be and going through the intestinal tract that way and then they can kind of build up and accumulate on themselves creating impactions. And this is just a picture of kind of an older horse's mouth and I just wanted to show the example of this really worn looking tooth is the oldest um, tooth in the horse's mouth and eventually a lot of the teeth will wind up looking worn and kind of smooth like that one is compared to these others that still have a little bit more of a kind of grinding surface on them. So the, the more the teeth become this sort of smooth and worn down appearance, the less able your horse is to really break down that hay. So that's when it's more important to start thinking about our complete feeds for these guys. And then times of stress. So we all know that our horses get stressed out when they travel, when they go to shows or competitions. If you have changes at home, so uh, maybe they have to live in a stall because they've been injured or um, you know, you have a new horse on the farm and that's stressing them out or their companion has gone away um, or hospitalization can really stress out our horses as well. And when that happens, they're more likely to develop gastric ulcers. They'll have a decreased appetite and decreased water consumption and all of these things can predispose our horses to colicking. So what can you do to help during these times? Well, ensuring water consumption like we talked about is great. Making mashes of their normal grain um, putting electrolytes in their water or on their feed. Um, you can also give them the tube electrolytes. And then some people before they go on really long trailer rides will have their veterinarian come and put a nasogastric tube in the horse and give them water and electrolytes that way so that they're already starting ahead on the hydration before going on a 12 hour or longer trailer ride. And that's something you can discuss with your veterinarian if that would be appropriate for you and your horse. And then GastroGuard and UlcerGuard are great products. Um, the drug is called Omeprazole, and a quarter tube is a preventative dose up to a full tube daily um, can really help prevent gastric ulcers in our horses that we know are going through a stressful time. So other tips, um, making our changes slowly in our horses' routines. So, New feed, haze, or grains um, can change the microflora of our, of our horse's gastrointestinal tracts and make them either build up gas, which can make them colic, or um, give them some diarrhea, which can make them uncomfortable and colic. And so this is sort of a conservative approach, but I think it's just good to keep in mind. If you're going to make a big change, you know, in the first week, let's, you know, do a quarter of the new feed and three quarters of the old feed. Week two, do half and half, and then by the third week, try and have them all in the new feed or crane. And then know your horse. So if the last time we vaccinated your horse there was a reaction or they colic or the last time we sedated them they colic, just let us know. We really want to be part of, you know, your team with your horse and, and help prevent things like that from happening. So if that's happened in the past, just let us know and we'll do what we can to prevent it from happening again. And knowing your meds. So Bute and Banamine and Equiox um, are all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications which can all cause um, horses to have some form of colic if given long enough or if your horse is particularly sensitive to that med. So just good to know how much your horse is on when they got their last dose so that you can help us kind of figure out the story if your horse does colic. And then antibiotics, all antibiotics. Um, are, have a risk of changing the flora of your horse's gastrointestinal tract and can cause them to have um, inappetence or diarrhea and so we want to know that too if your horse has been on antibiotics. And if your horse is on antibiotics and develops loose manure or decreased appetite, it's always you know a fine idea to not give the next dose and call your veterinarian and just try and figure out what's going on. And then I just wanted to touch a little bit on plans that are out there for your horses if they do colic. I think sometimes people are worried that insurance will be too expensive. And I just wanted to give this example is actually from a friend and colleague of mine. And her own horse is insured for um, $6,500 as the mortality or worth of the horse. And then that got her um, basically major medical and surgical coverage of eight to ten thousand dollars so if her horse has to go to surgery or has a colic episode she'll be covered and that is only costing five hundred dollars a year so just something to keep in mind um, sometimes I think we're worried it's going to be more expensive than it, than it actually could be so 
there's lots of different equine insurance companies out there, and I think it's you know worthwhile just investigating and seeing what coverage you could get for your horse. And then Smart Pack has a program called Call It Care, and so basically if you use a Smart Pack product daily, and you enroll in their program and follow these lists of guidelines, so an annual visit, vaccines, and dental with your veterinarian, and then annual fecal and twice yearly deworming with your veterinarian as well. The Smart Pack program will reimburse you for up to $7,500 for colic surgery. So just a couple options to have there in the back of your mind. Um, we all know that colic is scary and can wind up being expensive, so um, just wanted to give you some options there. Um, so now we'll have some time for questions, um, but also wanted to remind you guys about our upcoming presentation with Dr. Um, Hackett and Dr. Hassel at 6 p.m. on October 22nd, talking about what happens to your horse if they colic and wind up in the hospital. Thank you, Dr. Yoakum. Um, we have uh, several questions have been submitted. Um, if you are watching and want to submit a question, just uh, make a comment uh, directly below. and We'll do our best to answer those questions as, um, as effectively as possible. The first question uh, is from Rob. And he's, he, um, he typed in from Boulder, and this question is, is directed at Dr. Swain, and it has to do with other diseases um, that may present themselves um, in a similar fashion to colic. Um, and Dr. Swain, can you comment on that, please? Absolutely. So other diseases, there's lots of different conditions in, and, and organs in the abdomen that contribute to abdominal pain. And so anything that's going to cause an inflammatory response or um, stone formation, so the liver can form stones and so can the kidney. And so anything that, that causes any type of inflammation or, um, or stone formation can roll around or inflame the rest of the organs in the body and in the abdomen specifically and lead to colic pain. Cool, Dr. thank you. And can you give us a couple examples of those, please? Absolutely. So examples. The kidney stone was a very good example, and that can happen all the way down the urinary tract, so into the bladder even. If bladder stones um, are forming, then that can cause colic. And then other examples, there are liver stones that can form, and liver inflammation even, just widespread liver inflammation. And sometimes that can cause enough abdominal pain um, to present like a colic. Cool, thank you very much. Um, the next question comes from Jerry, and uh, Jerry wants to know, uh, once my horse has colic, are they more susceptible to having another episode? Uh, Dr. Yoakum, can you address this, please? Sure. Um, great question. So um, I think it's a little bit hard to say. I do think that um, depending on the type of colic that your horse has had, um, whether or not they're predisposed to colicking in the future definitely relates to that. Um, if, your colic, if your horse has um, had colic surgery, they're more likely to colic again. Um, and in terms of other, other forms of colic, some horses are, are more sensitive to environmental and dietary changes, and so your horse may be more predisposed to colic again in the future. Cool, thank you. Um, and we'll just take a, a short break. I, I wanted to give a shout out to one of our great clients, Judy Stoddard, who's, who's with us tonight. Wanted to say thanks for joining us. I uh, got to have a great conversation with Judy today and wanted to say thanks for taking the time um, to chat today and, and I'm glad you're joining us tonight. Uh, the next question I will take, and it has to do with mares who colic, and this um, was actually from a Facebook post today from, um, from, from a, a viewer. Um, the question posed, we lost two older mares to severe colic. None of the treatment touched the pain. Um, after finding a Mustang mare had, had pain every time she cycled, um, the client was convinced it had to do with reproductive um, relation and, and with other mares that experience severe colic. So she's wanting to know, um, does, does, uh, does, does colic in, in mares have to do with reproduction? And, and I'll, I'll, take this, I'll take this answer as I've seen several of these um, since coming out of school is, is you have a horse that, uh, you know, more specifically a female um, horse that is, is painful, and if you can clock it to where it's, it's, uh, it's pain you're seeing every 20 to 22 days, then I think you may have a case in point. And um, you know, some some mares just become painful when they're in heat, and maybe become more painful when they ovulate. So 
it is definitely something that we check out as veterinarians um, when we have a mare who's, who's colicked or maybe as a repeat offender. There's some medications that, that we can provide to that mare to, to keep them from cycling and maybe provide some pain relief during, during the time they're in heat. So as we, as we know with mares, they, they cycle during the summer um, and mostly in the fall and will we'll basically not cycle during the, the winter because of the day length. So if your mare if it's having some problems during the, during the spring, during the summer, and it ends up being every three weeks, I think you may have something. And if that's the case, then it's probably a good idea to get your veterinarian out and do a quick rectal exam and, and even a rectal ultrasound to see, A, is the mare in heat, and, and B, what can we do about it? So the next question I have is, is an, another Facebook question from Jennifer. And this question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give over to Dr. Swain. And it has to do with um, colic and foals. Uh, Dr. Swain, can you talk a little bit about common causes of colic and foals and maybe what, what can we do um, for these little guys? Great question. So colic and foals starts even on day one with uh, meconium impact impactions being common. So what can happen is that first manure that passes through in utero is supposed to be passed within the first couple hours of delivery. And if that doesn't happen or doesn't happen fully, then they can actually uh, get clogged up with that uh, meconium and then require, or it leads them into a colic episode. So that's one option for foals with colic. Other options uh, we see are associated with um, even twists. Some foals will twist their intestine, um, which is really uncommon but can occur. And then otherwise we see it as they age with gas. They're very sensitive uh, to pain, and so they can be very dramatic with their whenever they have gas in their abdomen, it causes more dramatic pain response and a more dramatic colic than we associate with our adult horses. So there's a lot of things that we see with foals. Cool, thank you very much. Um, the next question is a very important one, and it's a very common question that I get as a veterinarian, is, uh, is, the, is the idea of probiotics and what what role do probiotics and prebiotics place in the GI system and can they be used to prevent colic? So I do have a question here for Dr. Yoakum and the, the question is what's your thoughts on probiotics? So um, I, I think it may be, may be nice to come in and introduce what a probiotic is and, and what it does for, for our horse's GI system and how it can help our, our horses um, you know, maybe decrease the risk of colic. Yeah, so um, a probiotic is basically providing the horse's gastrointestinal tract with important um, bacteria, specifically Saccharomyces is one that has been studied, um, to help provide that good, good sort of healthy gut flora um, for the gastrointestinal tract, which we know if becomes disrupted, certainly can predispose our horses to colicking. Um, a prebiotic is essentially food for the probiotic. Um, and I think that probiotics certainly can be helpful in our horses, especially if they're going through any times of, of feeding changes um, or just to have them on sort of to keep everything as constant as possible. And there's different options out there. Um, some of the ones that uh, have been used by our team include Probios. Um, there's one called Fast Track and one called Equiotic. Um, so just there's a lot of others out there too. And I certainly think, you know, they can be very helpful. I don't think they're going to harm your horse, and I think if you have a specifically really sensitive horse to changes, it might be a good thing to try and add a daily probiotic to their regimen. Perfect. Thank you very much. And um, again, if you want to submit questions, all you have to do is comment on the bottom of the screen. Um, we have time for one more question, and I'll take that one. Um, but if you have any, any other questions, you have three veterinarians who are free um, to ask to answer any questions so you got about uh, two minutes to ask those so this uh, this this question comes from Ronald and he's down in Austin Texas Ronald says when I see my horse having signs of colic do I move them or do I keep them quiet and it's a great question because um, you know usually when these things happen is owners or uh, you know trainers are in a panic not sure what to do the horse may be uncomfortable maybe trying to to go down but I think the biggest thing um, is, is safety of the horse and safety of yourself 
And if the horse is not incredibly painful, I think walking or maybe even lunging these horses is great. Um, it also helps to maybe um, put them in a round pen or put them on a lunge line and just keep them moving. I know that that can really help quite a few horses with gas colic. It's not really going to do much for a horse that has a twist other than maybe keep its mind off its pain. So anytime you can walk the horse or keep it moving um, until we can get there is, is, is great. Um, so that, that concludes our Paging Dr. Ram Coping with Colic in the Field. I would like to thank Dr. Swain and thank Dr. Yoakum for their time. Um, we do have another session coming up with Drs. Hackett and Hassel on October the 22nd at 6 p.m. right back here on the CVMBS um, Google Hangout. Um, in addition, this video is going to be um, on YouTube, so the CVMBS, um, which means College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences YouTube page. And um, we hope to continue these Paging Dr. Ram sessions in the future. So please stay tuned to your favorite social media outlet to find out when these uh, Paging Dr. Ram sessions will be. But we hope to, we hope to follow it up in the winter um, or the spring. So with that, thank you again for watching. We do appreciate your attention, and uh, we'll see you soon.